there are some seriously complex, multifaceted reasons to why we crave junk food. I'm not talking about getting addicted to junk food or anything like that, to be honest. I'm talking about our inherent nature and why we lean towards junk food whenever possible. I mean, you could take someone that has never experienced junk food before and then put them in front of junk food and they're probably going to want it because there are a lot of different variables. It's not all biochemical. Some of it is mental, some of it is emotional, a lot of it is marketing, and you've got guys with PhDs out the whiz out doing all kinds of research on how to get you to eat a food. Now, the reason I'm saying this is to sort of disarm everybody because I was close to 300 pounds before. I know exactly what it feels like to be addicted to food. I know what it feels like to crave junk food. But even in my state now as a healthy person that preaches health constantly, I still want to fall victim to that stuff sometimes. So anyhow, what we're going to address in this video is the different angles. We're going to talk about the biochemistry. We're going to talk about the marketing side. We're going to talk about a lot of different things that are happening in terms of uh, salivary response, in terms of dynamic contrast. You're going to have an understanding. And if you understand all of this stuff, it will make you more mindful. And then you'll recognize when you're getting hooked on something or why you're making a decision in a certain direction. Before we dive in, I do want to make sure you hit that red subscribe button and then please hit that bell icon so you can turn on notifications whenever we post new videos just about daily. All right, so first thing I'm going to touch on is the dynamic contrast piece. Think about junk food. There's almost always a level of contrast in terms of the texture, in terms of the sensory contrast, right? Think about an Oreo, crunchy and soft. Think about a Twinkie, different texture on the outside from what's on the inside. This does things to your brain. Okay, it lights up the brain, it lights up a dopamine response, it lights up serotonin. Okay, so food marketers purposely do this. Now, I've been behind a lot of different food formulations before, and I know that even in the health world, even in the health sector of food product and food marketing, they still look at this kind of thing because it's still that hyper palatability, that overall mental response that we want to get out of food. Now, another one you can look at is look at cereal and milk. Okay, cereal by itself, sure, you want to take handfuls of it and it tastes good, but come on, it tastes better with milk. Why? Because that sensory contrast of the crunchiness along with something cold and liquidy, right? It's just a different texture. Then when we move into another piece of sort of the emotional, almost marketing piece, we look at the salivary response. Okay, uh, sal salad dressings are a perfect example. Okay, they're emulsified, right? So when they get into your mouth, the saliva emulsifies them more and it melts over, basically over your entire tongue and all your taste buds. So guess what? You want to eat more because you've just activated all kinds of different taste receptors on your tongue. Okay, so when someone says it melts in your mouth, that really is something that is there to help you get addicted to that or get more of a response from it. And it's so easy to consume something like a Snickers bar where a good portion of the calories are going to melt in your mouth where you're not ever able to register a signal that you even chewed it and consumed it. It's melting over your tongue, triggering your brain to light up like a Christmas tree, and then you're never really registering that you consumed calories until probably an hour later when you're already on the blood sugar roller coaster. It's pretty intriguing stuff. And if you look at this in all kinds of different categories of food, whether it's junk food, whether it's just delicious restaurant food, they're all applying the same principles. So you can see how we crave junk food so easily. I want to jump over to the biochemistry side for just a second and talk biochemistry slash evolution. Because if we look at how we've evolved over the last even hundred years, it's really interesting. We have something in our bodies or, or our bodies are equipped with this process known as the AMPK pathway. This AMPK pathway is the ability for your body to recognize when it is void of energy, when it doesn't have energy, when it's deprived of energy. So this AMPK pathway would allow your body to start utilizing your stored tissue efficiently. One could argue that you could be more efficient at utilizing this AMPK pathway. When I talk about intermittent fasting, when I talk about periods of caloric restriction, we are leveraging that AMPK pathway to get the body to utilize more of our stored tissues. Well, this AMPK pathway was designed for us to be able to be efficient at utilizing our own stored fuel because it was normal to not have a lot of food coming in all the time. Now, our bodies have not had a chance to catch up with the fact that now the whole tables have turned and it's more of a struggle to stay away from food than it is to find food. So our evolution, our biochemistry is built for still trying to find food. So when we find food, we get this insane reward because as far as our energy systems and processes in the body are concerned, it is a reward and we are still like, yes, 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 we got the food. When in reality, we should be like, yes, 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 we avoided the food and get the AMPK response, right? 
Anyhow, I digress. But now I want to show you an interesting study. Okay, there's a study that was published in the journal Frontiers of Bioscience. Now, up on the screen, I have some images. Okay, now these are fMRI and PET scans of individuals' brains. Okay, we've got addicts, okay, and then we have controls. And then we have an obese person and the control. Okay, now the red areas on these images are indicating where we have a high dopamine receptor availability. The green areas are where we have little dopamine receptor availability. I like this study because we're actually looking at the availability of a receptor. Dopamine is what gives us the response when we do something that we want. A simple analogy would be you, you crave something, you eat it, your brain lights up, you feel satisfied. You wanna check your phone, so you check your phone, your brain feels satisfied. That's a dopamine response. Obviously, it's a big issue with recreational drugs and everything like that, which is why we look at these images. So the receptor availability indicates, okay, this person has so much in the way of dopamine receptor availability, they don't need much of a given drug or much of a given food to elicit a response. Okay, that's the control. But then look at the addict and look at the obese scan. Okay, see how there's very little dopamine receptor availability? What this is indicating is that it's the same process. It's the same thing. So when we have less dopamine receptors available, it means that we need more of a given compound, more of a given food, a given drug to elicit the same response because we have less receptors available. So we need more in order to get it across. Now what's wild and where I get really intrigued by this is how this translates into other areas of our life. Let's say, for example, you are addicted to checking your phone. You check your phone every 30 seconds, you check your phone every minute, but guess what? Doesn't that mean that it might translate into another area of your life? So someone that's addicted to their phone is probably more likely to be addicted to food. And someone that is hooked on eating food all the time might check their phone or might you know, have a little bit more in the way of just the need to fill a void all the time. It's really interesting when you look at that. Now let's jump back a little bit to the food marketing side and how this kind of ties in a little bit. Then we look at caloric density. Okay, right now we have this triple threat in a lot of our junk food. We have fat, we have sugar, and we have salt. Okay, triggers maximum, maximum coverage of the taste buds, triggers a maximum triple threat effect on the brain, which again, masks any caloric density. So therefore, you just continue to eat and their goal is ultimately to get you to make money. So you wanna be able to substitute things that have a little bit more of a satiating aspect, but might still get you that same mental rise that you would get. This is why I highly recommend when people are doing any kind of dieting, that they still allow themselves to have regimented cheat meals, have structured cheat meals that give them sort of that mental fix, but maybe without the catastrophic downstream physiological effects. This is a perfect time for me to mention a sponsor of this video, which is Magic Spoon. So down below in the description, there is a link. Remember how I talked about cereal? Okay, well, Magic Spoon is an adult cereal. And what I mean by that, it's a cereal that still leverages all the taste, all the flavor that you would get from kids' cereal that you miss, but without the sugar, without the gluten, without the grains. Stuff is sweetened with allulose, so it has a very little impact on blood sugar, and that's why it makes my cut. So they're a big supporter of this channel. This stuff is awesome. I highly recommend you check it out after you finish watching this video if you wanna be able to have yourself a cereal cheat meal now and then. So like I said, they support this channel, they make this content possible, and quite frankly, if you do subscribe to this channel, the best way that you can support us and allow us to keep creating content is to support our sponsors. So big thank you to Magic Spoon. Check them out down below in the description after you watch this video. Okay, now I'm gonna jump back to biochemistry for a second. So in a similar study to the Frontiers in Bioscience study, there's a study that was published in PLOS1 that took a look at, once again, obese people. And it gave them an injection of pure glucose, so it didn't even hit their mouth. Injection of pure glucose, and they ended up having less of a dopamine response, indicating that even bypassing the mouth, we need more sugar or more glucose to trigger a feeling of satisfaction. Okay, once you're obese or once you're actually going down that route. So we have some pretty solid concrete evidence there. But then when we jump back and we go back to kind of the food marketing side, another thing I want you to be aware of is the complexity of both aromas and taste. Okay, think about this for a second. If you walk into a room and that room has a really bad smell, if you stay in that room for long enough, you're going to become somewhat numb to that smell. Okay, you're going to become just immune to it. You're just not gonna recognize it anymore. If you were to go out of the room for five minutes and come back, 
you might smell it, but not as intensely. But if you go out of the room for two days and then you come back and it still smells, you're gonna feel it again. It's the same kind of sensation that we would get with food, right? So what food marketers do and food scientists do is they make sure that there's complex varieties of aromas and tastes so that even though you would feel like you're gonna get burnt out on a given smell or taste, you have such a wide spectrum of different tastes and flavors coming at you that you don't really burn out on it. So it's like tortilla chips, for instance. They have a very wide spectrum, broad array of tastes. Salt, starch, savory, this, that, you name it, fat. Okay, and then you eat them and you don't really get tired of it. You can just keep going and going and going and going. Okay, so if you're aware of this and you could recognize it, it makes a very big difference. And all the stuff I'm talking about today is all about just being mindful. If you can make a concerted effort to keep in touch with all these things that I'm talking about, it makes it that much easier to make a solid decision. The most important thing for you to remember is that anytime something is in your pantry, and this goes for all foods, it is all about playing on an emotion not necessarily the taste or even the health aspect of a food. Okay, when you look at the ketogenic world, you look at any health sector right now, they still play into the same game and that's okay because that's how you have to compete in the world of the economy with, with food. Okay, but just recognize that you are making a decision for what you eat based on emotion more than anything. You watch TV, you see a commercial, you're not gonna see a depressed guy eating a cake. You're gonna see a happy family eating birthday cake to sell a cake, right? It's selling the emotion. Okay. Even when we come to, to Magic Spoon, for instance, we talk about that. Same kind of thing. It's all about connecting with an emotion as a kid. Okay. I had positive emotions eating cereal as a kid. So if I want to eat some Magic Spoon cereal because it helps me feel that way, helps me feel that way and relive that, then that's okay. I'm living on an emotion. I just want to make sure that I'm making a strong conscious emotion that I'm aware of and it's not having the same physiological impact as if I were to have a bunch of sugar. So same kind of thing, even with diet sodas, even with beverages now and then. If you use them as a void fill and you use them to kind of substitute, it's okay. Just be aware of when you are substituting and be mindful of all the things. Anyhow, it's okay to crave junk food. It's just up to you to understand and be mindful so you don't fall victim to it all the time. I'll see you tomorrow.